Hi, this is a reading of Oswald Chambers' biography. I'm not sure how many parts this is going to take, but for years I've always wanted to use my voice to read aloud, and never figured out how to do that in any formal way. So I'm dedicating the reading of this book to Teresa near the sunset. Oswald Chambers' Abandoned to God, the life story of the author of My Utmost for His Highest. And here's a photo of Oswald Chambers and his little daughter, Kathleen. I think she was around five or six or seven when he passed away at, I think he was 43 years old. Chapter 1, A Kernel of Wheat Cairo, Egypt, November 16th, 1917 Biddy Chambers glanced beyond the straight rows of thin wooden crosses toward the tall iron gates of the British Military Cemetery in old Cairo. She knew the funeral cortege must be nearing, but the high stone wall surrounding the burial ground where she stood shielded her from the familiar street sounds, so close yet so distant from her mind today. Beside her stood four-year-old Kathleen, quiet and uncomprehending. She knew that her daddy had gone to be with Jesus, and that was wonderful. But Daddy had gone lots of places before, to Alexandria, to Fayum, to Ismailia, or to Suez. And no doubt Daddy would be home again soon. Biddy glanced down at the little girl she and Oswald called their Flower of God. Their eyes met, and Kathleen's face broke into a smile. Biddy wished she knew her daughter's thoughts. Perhaps she understood perfectly that her daddy was now helping the soldiers in heaven and wouldn't be coming back at all. Because of her childlike trust in God, she might be able to accept that awful finality better than all the grown-ups around her. Kathleen did know that something had made her mother very sad. The day before, Biddy had wept as she wrapped her arms around her carefree daughter and said, Your daddy has gone to heaven. That was the first time Kathleen had ever seen her mother cry. A glimpse of horses on the street drew Biddy's eye back to the gate. She squinted a bit, her characteristic reaction to something with which she didn't completely agree. She was uncomfortable with the extent of this military funeral for Oswald. She had consented to it only because the men he had served and loved of the men he had served and loved. This was their way of honoring him and saying goodbye. The funeral cortege had started at 4 o'clock p.m., from Giza Red Cross Hospital a mile away on the west bank of the Nile. The casket draped with the Union Jack and covered with a spray of white chrysanthemums rested on a gun carriage drawn by a team of four black horses. Six officers marched alongside the casket while an escort of a hundred soldiers followed with rifles reversed. The traditional sign of respect for a fallen comrade in arms. Under a cloudless sky, the procession had moved eastward along across the bridge spanning the murky green waters of the Nile. Donkey carts and vegetable vendors stood silently in the dusty streets as the soldiers and the gun carriage moved slowly past. 
barefoot children gazed in wonder. In the west, the glowing sun, revered and worshipped by the ancient Egyptians, dropped toward the Sphinx and the towering pyramids of Giza. Beyond them, the great western desert stretched silently into a shimmering horizon. By November 1917, World War I had slogged into its fourth murderous year, and death was a frequent visitor to the hospitals and convalescent homes of Egypt. Military funerals were common in Cairo, but this one was unusual, containing elements reserved for a high-ranking officer or government official. It was extraordinary that the man so honored was neither officer nor official, but the Reverend Oswald Chambers, YMCA secretary at nearby Zaytun. A large contingent of civilians, including women and Egyptians, awaited the procession at the burial site. Even the native servants from Zaytun had come in solemn grief. One eyewitness later recalled that almost everyone Chambers knew in Cairo found their way quietly and simply to this place. Affectionately known among the troops as the OC, an abbreviation for the officer in charge, Chambers had died the day before of complications following surgery for a ruptured appendix. As the word of his passing traveled up the line from Cairo to Palestine, hundreds of men received the news in stunned disbelief. Surely there was some mistake, a garbled message, a misunderstanding. Why would God take Chambers when he had so few men like him? And why at the age of 43, it makes no sense at all. Many soldiers stole away to quiet places to face their loss in private and give thanks for the now complicated life, now completed life of this young dynamic man of God. How many times he had said to them, nothing that happens can upset God or the almighty reality of redemption. Nothing that happens can upset God or the almighty reality of redemption. On the front lines near Beersheba, the news struck Peter Kay like a bullet in the chest. His mind wandered back to the days at Zaytun with his little friend Kathleen Chambers and her father, how easily they had slipped past his guard against religious people. Oswald had been the first chaplain to ever penetrate Peter Kay's tough exterior through simple friendship and genuine respect. Peter's only religion had been wine, women, and song. When he listened to Chambers talk about Jesus Christ and his atonement, he pictured the night he stood outside the devotional hut and claimed Christ as his Savior and Lord, and now Chambers was dead? Peter Kay bowed his head and wept uncontrollably when he heard the news. None of his mates from the Australian outback could understand what had reduced the battle-hardened soldier to such tears. Biddy watched the officers gently carry her husband's casket into the peaceful quiet of the cemetery. Throughout the long days and nights beside him in the hospital, she had been so sure that Oswald would make it. The word from the Bible to her own heart during that time had seemed so clear. The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Gladys Ingram and Eva Spink held hands tightly trying to hold back the tears they knew Oswald would have smiled away. At the Bible Training College in London, 
he had spoken so confidently of a loving God who never makes mistakes. When the war came, hadn't God led them all to Egypt in his service? Hadn't he promised to watch over them and keep them in his care? Hadn't he? Reverend Samuel Zwimmer, a noted American missionary, spoke briefly along with Padre William Watson, a Scottish chaplain. Their message was of Jesus Christ, of his work through his servant Oswald Chambers, and of every Christian's eternal hope in Christ. Then those assembled sang Psalm 121 from the Scottish Psalter. I to the hills will lift mine eyes, from whence doth mine come mine aid. My safety cometh from the Lord, who heaven and earth hast made. Thy foot he'll not let slide, nor will he slumber that thee keeps. Behold, he that keeps Israel, he slumbers not, nor sleeps. The Lord thee keeps, the Lord thy shade, on thy right hand doth stay. The moon by night thee shall not smite, nor yet the sun by day. The Lord shall keep thy soul, he shall, preserve thee from all ill. Henceforth thy going out and in, God keep, forever will. After a prayer of thanksgiving and committal, they sang a final hymn, For all the saints who from their labors rest. Stanley Barling, William Jessup, and Lord Radstock of the YMCA sang with the mingled sense of loss and hope that Christians know in the face of death. With voices struggling through a flood of emotions, they remembered the optimism and irrepressible confidence in God that had endeared chambers to them all. On the final verses, their voices, along with the others, rang out toward the twilight settling over the distant Moncatum Hills. The Lyrics But lo, there breaks a yet more glorious day, the saints triumphant rise in bright array. The King of glory passes on his way. Alleluia, alleluia. From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl streams in the countless host, singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Alleluia, Alleluia. A firing party from the Northumberland Fusiliers discharged three rifle volleys into the evening sky. The reports echoed into the distance as a bugler sounded the last post. Stanley Barling plucked a white chrysanthemum from the spray standing next to the grave, knelt down and handed it to little Kathleen with a smile. The words he wanted to say stuck in his throat as she sniffed the flower and returned his smile. He took her hand in both of his, gave it a gentle squeeze, then rose to his feet. How could she understand how much he was going to miss her father? The crowd dispersed, talking, dabbing at eyes, and yes, even smiling. For some, there was only a deep sense of loss, but for those who knew Oswald and his Savior, the sense of Christ's triumph overpowered the greatest pain. Biddy gently grasped Kathleen's hand and walked toward a waiting car. As they drove toward the Zwemer's house in central Cairo, she closed her eyes and saw Oswald, a few months before, polishing his boots in the bungalow at Zaytun. They had just visited their friend Gertrude Ballinger, suffering from typhoid fever and lying near death in a hospital. Biddy had said, I wonder what God is going to do. 
between brushstrokes of his boots, Oswald had replied. I don't care what God does. It's what God is that I care about. Biddy managed a smile. She knew the heart of love and concern from which her husband had spoken. What might seem a callous remark. He cared deeply what happened to Miss Ballinger, but he knew that God's actions could be very confusing while the Lord himself never was confusing. She and Oswald had been married for just over seven years, and now, humanly speaking, the worst had happened. She was a widow at 34, with a young daughter, no financial resources, and no means of support. If that were not enough, she was living away from the care of home and family in an inhospitable desert region of a foreign land during a time of war. Already people were asking questions for which she had no answers. Are you going back to England? What will this do to Kathleen? How will you manage without Oswald? Biddy closed her eyes, pulled Kathleen close to her, and softly began to sing the hymn that welled up in her heart. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. It would not be the last time she, thangs, she sang those words, when all seemed lost, and her only hope lay in the grace of Almighty God. I'm going to skip ahead to the chapter, chapter 12, entitled The Young Lady on the Boat. And I will say, this young lady, Gertrude Hobbs, had a goal of becoming the secretary to the Prime Minister of England. God's hand shifted her to being the secretary and the court reporter taking shorthand for one of the greatest human beings in the past 200 years to comment on the things of God. The Young Lady on the Boat, 1908. Gertrude Hobbs was 24 years old when she watched the docks of Liverpool slip away behind the churning foam of the SS Baltic's propellers. In the early 20th century, it was not unheard of for a young woman to make a transatlantic voyage unescorted. But neither was it common for a young woman such as Gertrude to be traveling alone across the Atlantic. The fact that Oswald Chambers happened to be traveling on the same boat added an element of certainty and security, more for her mother than for herself. Gertrude was on her way to New York City to visit her good friend Marion, who said that secretarial jobs were plentiful in New York. It was a grand adventure, and she was quite unconcerned that she had only $16 in her purse. As the ship steamed up to full speed, Oswald's thoughts ranged back to his voyage with brother Nadaka on this same ship 18 months before. That journey had been pure comradeship and adventure, but this was different. Not a foot away from him stood a lovely, intelligent young woman whom he had known casually for some two and a half years. With her head turned toward the receding coastline of England, he had a chance to study her face for the first time. He had to look down because the top of her head just reached the level of his chin. He saw that her brown hair was parted just to one side of the middle and swept back into a bun. Almond-shaped blue eyes twinkled under arched brows and her mouth rested 
in a straight line that resembled a kind of perpetual smile. How would he describe her face in a word? Pretty, soft, kind? It was a view of Gertrude he had never seen from the pulpit or even across the table at tea. Why was he seeing it now? Strange thoughts and feelings rose within him, and he wasn't sure if he liked them or not. No matter, for the next ten days, courtesy required that he at least accompany her to meals and help her get acclimated to the ship. Once in New York, she would begin her new job, and for the next two months, he would be so occupied in preaching and counseling that the thoughts of her would be the farthest thing from his mind. For now, though, he had to decide how to address her. Gertrude was too formal, and besides, he had a sister with that name. Her family called her Gertie or Truda, but he needed a nickname of his own. For reasons unknown, he decided on Biddy, a friendly name with none of its current negative connotations. Biddy. During walks on the deck each day, he learned more about this intriguing young lady. When she was a child, winter bouts with bronchitis kept her out of school every year for two months at a time. She eventually left school to help her mother at home and allow the family resources to be used for educating her older sister, Dias, and her brother, Herbert. While other children might have languished in self-pity, young Gertrude was not deterred by her winter confinement and lack of formal education. She had a single ambition, to become secretary to the Prime Minister of England. So she set herself to studying Pittman's shorthand at home and learning to type. Knowing that many young men and women could take shorthand, she therefore decided to outdistance the field in speed and accuracy. Mrs. Hobbs and Dias took turns reading articles and book selections as Gertrude transcribed them into shorthand. Not content to function like a machine, Gertrude listened for the sense and context of what was read. Along with speed and accuracy, she sought understanding as well. Two weeks before Gertrude's 15th birthday, her father died at the age of 50, leaving the family in financial difficulty. Her daughter, her sister Dias, finished school and secured a good position with the civil service. She continued to live at home, generously contributing to the family income. By the time Gertrude was old enough to work full time, she could take shorthand dictation at the phenomenal rate of 250 words per minute, faster than anyone was likely to talk. This skill won her a position as secretary to a high-ranking officer at the Woolwich Arsenal. Britain's sprawling munitions factory some 10 miles east of London. She didn't seem to mind working in close proximity to thousands of tons of highly explosive cordite, gunpowder, and filled artillery shells. She did, however, object to men who saved their dictation until the end of the day and expected her to type and post the letters before she went home. She was happy to leave the arsenal for a job with a firm of solicitors in the prestigious Lincoln's Inn Fields in the heart of London's legal district. Now Biddy was off to a new adventure in America. Every day aboard the SS Baltic, she and Oswald walked together, ate together, and discovered new things about each other. She admired his keen mind, his bright humor, and the deep love he held for Jesus Christ. 
Oswald was impressed with everything about Biddy, from her determination and ability to her love for animals and her genuine interest in people. How could they have shared so much in common without his realizing it before? When the voyage ended, they parted company, but a steady correspondence quickly developed between the two. He wrote to her from Cincinnati on June 20th, a day before he plunged into the camp meeting at God's Bible School. He writes, Be very patient and very confident in him. Do not be a little bit perturbed that you cannot answer Mr. Moore's questions regarding God. God is not a fact of common sense, but of revelation. Tell him God lives, evidence to your heart when you abandon your right to yourself and let God take the rule. On July 3rd, after two draining weeks of preaching and counseling, Oswald's tone to Biddy was more personal. It is a great refreshment to think of you, for I have had such a drenching with the sad and sordid sorrows of so many blighted lives. But glory be to our God, how blessedly he saves and delivers and heals. During July, Oswald's travels took him from Cincinnati to camp meetings in North Attleboro, Massachusetts, and Old Orchard, Maine, New York City. Oh. New York City and Biddy were right on the way. Undoubtedly, he called on her as he traveled north and again before he left for England. An August 19th letter indicates a rapid progression of their feelings for each other. All in his good time, we have the love, thank God, and the discipline of our characters alone. Alone or blended, it is all in his hands. All in his good time, we have the love, thank God and the discipline of our characters, whether alone or blended, everything is in his hands. Biddy remained in New York to finish her job commitment while Oswald returned to a demanding schedule of league meetings in Britain. For the first time in many years, however, he had someone to whom he could pour out his deepest thoughts and feelings. On August 20th, he wrote, the great hunger is on me more than ever for him and his work. Oh, how few love him and how feeble is my most passionate love. I scarcely know anyone who is consumed for him. It is all for creeds and phrases and belief. But for him, how few. To know him, that is it. How I fear and hate the pattern and print of this age. On August 23rd from London, he writes, It is a Sunday night, and I have finished my second Sunday at Wesley's Chapel. God, as usual, undertook. He looms large again tonight. Oh, that I had more of heart and brain and body for him. My mood tonight is one of sorrow that I cannot serve and be spent for him better. On September 6th, 16th, from Eltham, he writes, How does your spirit develop in intimacy with him? Nothing else is right if that goes not well. He has all the circumstances in his hand. In his hand my whole life and yours with me must be for him and not for domestic bliss. On October 4th, he writes, Have a blessed and beautiful text for you. I have a beautiful and blessed text for you. For I know the plans that I am planning for you, saith the Lord, 
plans of welfare and not of calamity, to give you an end and expectation. That is a new translation, but it is an exquisite one. October 5th, he writes, I do not think anyone realizes more keenly than I do the struggles and difficulties of people, and yet all my messages broke them on the wheel. On October 18th, he wrote to Biddy's mother from Plymouth. Dear Mrs. Hobbs, do you object to my corresponding with your youngest daughter, Gertrude? I love her and naturally would like to write her and see her occasionally as my missions allow. But we should like to know that this is with your sanction and certain knowledge of the kind of friendship that is forming. I return to London on Friday, October 23rd. I shall esteem your reply as early as convenient. Highly. Yours heartily, Oswald Chambers. As he awaited a reply from Mrs. Hobbs, his letters to Biddy continued. October 19th, Plymouth, England. He writes, God should make our faces radiant and patient for all the sordid cares of others. Our love but makes a more sure haven of rest for multitudes of strained and stressed lives. From our love should spring great patience and great gentleness and service for others, for love is of God. On October 21st, he writes this, High over us shadows his cross. This have I done for thee. What hast thou done for me? The world is our parish, and he will open the way. Mrs. Hobbs replied immediately, but indicated that instead of clearing the air, Oswald had merely muddied the water. He wrote to her again on October 21st. Dear Mrs. Hobbs, thank you very much for your letter, and I am deeply concerned that my letter gave you more trouble than it otherwise would if I had only thought to have told you the sort of friendship that I mean. And I certainly do not mean platonic, which to me is apt to mean the most ordinary of all friendships but I do mean a friendship with view to an engagement, an ultimate marriage. Regardless, regarding a mere ordinary friendship, I should never have thought it necessary to ask your sanction, but I could not hold correspondence with your daughter, having in my mind and heart what I have, without your certain knowledge. Please forgive my causing you unnecessary anxiety over and above the inevitable anxiety such a letter as mine must certainly cause a mother. My present position as a missioner is just temporary and quite a godsend. It has been a good break to me from my college tutorial work, and already permanent work is inviting me, and as soon as that is settled, I should like to become engaged. Again, thanking you for your letter and hoping you will be able to reply to me before I leave here Friday morning. I am yours heartily, Oswald Chambers. After posting the letter to Gertrude's mother, he walked along the waterfront and gazed out at Plymouth's famous harbor known as the Sound. Far out on Penley Point, the lighthouse cast its beam of welcome and warning. You're almost home, it seemed to say, to ships off the rugged coast of Devon. Beware of the rocks as you near your goal. Oswald thought how quickly God had broken into his life of solitary service and given him a love for Biddy. He was astonished by the longing he had for her and staggered that she loved him too. His letters to Biddy continued. 
October 23rd, Plymouth. I have nothing to offer you but my love and steady, lavish service for him. I can hear you say, Foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. I have his word. Let us both take it. Subsequent days will prove his meaning in it. Let us go forth unto him outside of the camp, bearing his reproach. Mark it in your Bible, and I will do the same with the date. Following the mission in Plymouth, Oswald traveled north to the little Yorkshire village of Denby Dale. It had been two years since he and Nadaka stepped off the train and put their feet down in Denby Dale for Jesus Christ. The results of their first meetings were still being felt upon his return. On October 28th, he wrote to Biddy, He takes what we present him, Romans 12, verse 1. He takes what we present him, and from the basis of a heart at leisure from itself, he can pour out his blessing to others. Pour out lavishly all you have on others. You have surely far more reason for making dull, sordid places bright and beautiful because of the love that is in your heart. No good thing will he withhold from us. With pen still in hand, he contemplated the next letter he needed to write. Until this letter was sealed and posted, he could not move on to anything else. He had already put it off too many times and expended far too much time and energy thinking about it. He must write this letter now and put the matter behind him. He scribbled out the heading, then gripping the pen tightly in his long slender fingers, he stared out the window, paralyzed. For a 34-year-old man known in England and America, for his unique vocabulary and powerful clarity of expression, this was an agonizing impasse. After several false starts and crumpled pages, he took a deep breath and began to write, writing to his mother and his father, from Denby Dale. Denby Dale, October 28, 1908. My dear mother and father, I want to tell you that I am in love, and it is quite such a new experience that it opens up so many unknown things that I do not know quite how to put it. I love plenty men and women, and I am loved in return, not slightly but grandly and truly. Yet this is quite different. It did not come passionately or suddenly but all permeatingly, and now I have abruptly told you the fact. I am in love. I have been more usually absorbed in him and in work for him than even you would suppose. That this thing has been a trial foreign to me and now has come a sense I never had before. A sense of my own loneliness came to me. Of course, I do not know what the future holds out, and I do not intend towards anxiety. My call is still as strong as ever. Go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations, and I will go, and ultimately I expect Miss Gertrude A. Hobbs will go with me. I cannot yet conceive what good I can be to any woman, but I never feared until now, yet I am sure that his hand is leading. Of course I quite understand the avalanche of common sense and wisdom that my many kind friends will see fit to subject me to, and I'll try my best not to be overwhelmed by their comments or frozen by their comments. But I want you to know from me, and I find it awkward and difficult to write about myself. My thoughts for seven years past 
have never pictured me further on than 35 years of age. And if you remember, I sometimes used to say, I should like to go to more commodious premises then. And now this comes. And in amazement, I took the cup of this falling in love. I took this cup more or less dazed and stupid. And I am very and unspeakably thankful for this cup. Please tell Gertrude, I have ever lacked tenderness, much to my distress and prayer, and perhaps this new relationship will develop tenderness. Now, my dear mother, excuse this letter writing so incoherent and abrupt, because I cannot write this sort of thing well. I would like to bring her to tea before I go away next time. May I? Your loving son, Oswald. There. It was done. The letter was complete. He could almost predict the reactions when the letter arrived in London. His mother would read it with a smile and say, of course he can bring her to tea. She would think it was wonderful that her youngest son was in love. His father would frown and say, Does Oswald have a position, a salary, a home, or any set plans for the future? No. His itinerance preaching with the League of Prayer is a hand-to-mouth existence, providing nothing more than meals, lodging, and train fare to the next engagement. Does Oswald have any concept of what is needed to support a wife? and eventually children? Not likely. Yet it is time for him to bring his head out of the clouds and face the realities of life. Perhaps marriage will force him to do it. Oswald was used to the criticism of his family and his friends, particularly in the area of money. He believed that Jesus' words, give to everyone who asked, meant exactly that. One evening, walking back to his lodgings after conducting a league of prayer meeting, he was accosted by a drunken man asking for money. Chambers listened intensely to the man's story and then told the man, Man, I believe your story is all lies. But my master tells me to give to everyone that asks. So, there is my last shilling. After putting the coin into the man's hand, Chambers noticed that it was not a shilling, but a half crown, worth two and a half times more than a shilling. It didn't matter. There you are, he told the man. The Lord bless you. When Oswald's hostess heard this story, she chided him for being foolish. I believe beggars are sent to test our faith, said Chambers. Nonplussed. My duty is plain to obey the command of God and to give to everyone that asks. What the recipient may do with it is not my concern. As the woman shook her head in disbelief, Oswald added with a twinkle, Besides, the Lord always gives double for all I give away. The next morning, Chambers received a letter enclosing a gift from a person who was bedridden and could not come to hear him preach. The gift was three times what he had given the drunken man the night before. Humorous or barbed comments about his living on nothing a year had little effect on Chambers' dedication to his chosen path. When his way caused others pain, he deeply regretted it, but he was not swayed from his course. But now he was about to ask a fine young woman to join him in this life. Many people considered one of a spiritual vagabond. Was it fair to this woman that he asked her to marry him? He read again the letter he had just written to his parents and shook his head at the woodenness of his expression. How could a relationship which filled him with such anticipation and joy appear so cold and stiff and lifeless on paper. 
Laying the letter aside, he opened his Bible and thought ahead to the evening meeting. It was the same sometimes with his preaching. Many nights he fell into bed wishing that more of his love for Christ would have come through in what he had said. If I could only tell him as I know him, he thought. Biddy returned to England from America in time for Oswald's special mission at Speak Hall. On November 13th, he took her to St. Paul's Cathedral, a favorite place for both of them. For a time, they wandered through the vast nave, unable to resist the pull of their eyes skyward toward the magnificent dome. Then, standing in front of Holman Hunt's famous painting, The Light of the World, they pledged their love to each other and became engaged. A small ring set with three tiny diamonds sealed their promise. It was more than a romantic gesture that brought Chambers to this place for this most important moment of promise. Hunt's painting shows a door, locked, barred, and overgrown with ivy. Christ holds a lantern in his left hand as he knocks gently with his right. Beneath the painting are the words of Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Oswald would have been quick to notice that Christ came at night, carrying light, and a gentle request for entrance to a door that could be opened only from the inside. The meaning was clearly and skillfully portrayed on the canvas. He and Biddy were pledging their love, first and foremost, to Jesus Christ and to his work in this dark world. Their commitment went far beyond a hope for personal happiness to embrace a calling to belong first to God and then to each other. At the same time, their engagement was a love match of the highest order. No one who knew either of them would ever view their pledge as some utilitary arrangement, utilitarian arrangement for more efficiently furthering the kingdom of God efficiency in the usual sense of the greatest benefit for the lowest cost was not in chambers vocabulary his approach was spend and be spent with nothing held back biddy loved him dearly and shared his vision they left saint paul's ablaze with hope unmindful of the cold or the night the end of this chapter, the young lady on the boat, is inserted a piece written by Oswald Chambers entitled Decision, London, March 8, 1895. At last the fog has lifted, the clouds have sifted, my soul which drifted has been uplifted into the light. At last the calls descended, power with it blended. My soul has ascended, God has transcended, mortal night. At last ambition's breaking from all that's shaking, the thirst it's slaking, the good it's taking, is divine. At last I am contented, though thought demented, to have consented and not repented to take this course. Thus ends chapter 12, The Young Woman on the Boat, 1908.